All right, so big breaking news this evening from the January 6th investigation, and it involves this man, John Eastman, an attorney for President Trump, seen here uh, pumping up the crowd at Trump's big January the 6th rally just before the attack on the Capitol. The January 6th investigation has described Eastman as a, quote, central player in the development of a legal strategy to justify a coup. Now, Eastman infamously wrote that two memos for President Trump outlining what he described as a legal path for Vice President Mike Pence to toss out electoral votes from several states that Joe Biden had won and thereby handing the 2020 election to Trump. Eastman and Trump both repeatedly pressured Mike Pence to follow these plans to toss out those electoral votes when it came time for him to preside over the certification of the election on January the 6th. And of course, Pence, as we know, did not bow to the pressure campaign. The January 6th investigation naturally had a lot of questions for John Eastman. But when they subpoenaed him, Eastman pled the fifth. He asserted his right not to incriminate himself under questioning. Politico called it, quote, an extraordinary assertion by someone who worked closely with Trump to attempt to overturn the 2020 election results. Now, unable to get his testimony, as you can imagine, the January 6th investigation subpoenaed John Eastman's records. More importantly, his emails from his time working with Trump to overturn the election. Mr. Eastman has been trying to block the investigation from getting those emails, uh, claiming that he was acting as Donald Trump's attorney and therefore his emails are protected by attorney-client privilege. Now, here is where things actually get interesting. Tonight, the January 6th investigation has filed a motion in court making its case for why those emails are actually not protected by attorney-client privilege. And what they are saying is that the attorney-client privilege is void if what the lawyer and the client are communicating about is doing something illegal or fraudulent. Under the law, you and your lawyer can't just simply plan something illegal and then claim attorney-client privilege to shield all the evidence of that crime. And the January 6th investigation is now saying to the judge tonight, we believe Donald Trump and his lawyer, John Eastman, were engaged in crimes. Let me read some of it for you. This is from tonight's filing for the January 6th investigation. Evidence and information available to the committee establishes a good faith belief that Mr. Trump and others may have engaged in criminal and or fraudulent acts. And that plaintiff's legal assistance was used in furtherance of those activities. The president sought to use the vice president to manipulate the results in his favor. Had this effort succeeded, the electoral count would have been obstructed, impeded, influenced, and at the very least delayed all without any genuine legal justification and based on the false pretense that the election had been stolen. There is no genuine question that the president and plaintiff attempted to accomplish this specific illegal result. Uh, the select committee also has a good faith basis for concluding that the president and members of his campaign engaged in a criminal conspiracy to defraud the United States by interfering with the election certification process disseminating false information about election fraud and pressuring state officials to alter state election results and federal officials to assist in that effort. The conspirators also obstructed a lawful government function by pressuring the vice president to violate his duty to count the electoral certificates presented from certain states. The apparent objective of these efforts was to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election and declare Donald Trump the winner. In this way, the conspiracy aimed to obstruct and interfere with the proper functioning of the United States government. So again, tonight, let's be clear about this. The January 6th investigation has gone to court to say that Donald Trump's lawyer can't claim attorney-client privilege for his communications because he and Trump and others on Trump's campaign were engaged in crimes. Joining us now is former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, Barbara McQuaid. Uh, last week, she published what she called a model prosecution memo, analyzing actual potential charges against Donald Trump for his scheme to pressure uh, Mike Pence to overturn the election. And incredibly, the two crimes that she thought may have been committed are the two crimes that January 6th investigation names in this filing tonight. Conspiracy to defraud the United States and obstruction of an official proceeding. Uh, Barb, it's great to have you with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as, as the person who kind of, you know, I, I'm using this word here, predicted that these might be the statutes that Trump violated, what's your reaction to this filing tonight and, and how significant is it? 
Well, I think it's a very significant filing because it's the first time the committee has said out loud what the crimes may have been and pulled together the evidence of what that uh, crime may have looked like. I, I think that any prosecutor who looked at that evidence in the way I did and the way that the former prosecutors who are leading this investigation for the January 6th committee are doing, it, it, it really jumps out as fairly obvious potential crimes. Now, of course, the details of the evidence matters here, but one of the things they do in this filing that I think is, is so significant is they document all of the evidence that they have that is beginning to come into focus that they've been gathering from all of these sources. We know that because of some public statements that Donald Trump was pressuring Mike Pence to, uh, to refuse to certify the election. But I think some of the things that are coming into view are the hard part, which is showing that Donald Trump knew that it was false to say that he had lost the, that he'd won the election. Uh, and they document and list all of that evidence in this filing. Yeah, I was going to ask you if you can lay that out for us a little bit. The investigation has told the federal court it has a good faith reason to believe Trump, Eastman and others have committed federal crimes. Um, explain for us the case they lay out. And do you think at this point it is a convincing one? I do. Um, you know, for either of these crimes, obstruction of an official proceeding or conspiracy to defraud the United States, each has slightly different elements. But I think the key factor that has always appeared maybe elusive is proving Donald Trump's intent, that he knew that what he was saying was fraudulent. When he was telling Mike Pence you should uh, change the outcome of the election, that he knew that was based on a lie and based on fraud. And so they document all the ways that he knew that this was false. Number one, his own cybersecurity chief at the Department of Homeland Security said so publicly. William Barr, his attorney general, said so publicly. The director of the Office of National Intelligence, John Ratcliffe, his appointee, said so publicly. Barr's successors at the Justice Department told him repeatedly there was no fraud. He had an internal campaign memo for the Trump campaign that concluded there was no fraud. And 61 out of 62 judges in all the court cases that were filed across the country found that there was no fraud. The one case that the Trump campaign won was on an unrelated issue relating to affidavit mounts to suggest that Donald Trump absolutely knew that there was no fraud here. In fact, one judge said there was not a scintilla of evidence that there is fraud. You know, it's like, Eamon, it's like um, there's an instruction in, um, that juries get about willful blindness. Yeah. You can't turn a blind eye to something when it's highly probable that it's true. If someone tells you that the world is round, you can't say the world is flat after, in, the, in the face of repeated evidence that it is round. If scientists tell you and they show you photos and you continue to persist that the world is flat, at some point a jury will believe that you're lying. Yeah, and at the point, I guess the point you're making is that you can't just plead stupidity and ignorance and saying, I didn't know, despite the overwhelming evidence that was presented to you. I, I want to ask you about another piece of the January 6th news tonight, because there's a member of the far-right Oath Keepers uh, militia who has just pled guilty to seditious conspiracy uh, in the attack on the Capitol, which in of itself is pretty significant. What does that mean and how big of a deal is it? It's a very big deal, Eamon. I think, um, you know, seditious conspiracy is a charge that is used rarely because it requires not only a use of force to interfere with the government authority, um, but it requires that it is the authority of the United States. And so uh, what they argued there in that case, the allegation was that they were using force to stop the lawful transfer of presidential power. We now have a defendant in that group of Oath Keepers, 11, who says, yes, I did do this. And also importantly, he is cooperating. Uh, and this particular defendant also was with Roger Stone on January 6th, earlier that day. So his cooperation promises to be potentially very fruitful. Yeah, incredible. Two significant developments today from the January 6th uh, committee. Barbara McQuaid is the former U.S. attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan. Barbara, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. Greatly appreciate your expertise tonight.